Well, like I said, you could turn in your Bibles to Luke 17. Um, it's hard to blame them. It's hard to blame them, actually, but sometimes we do anyway. Uh, and I mean, uh, it's the 12 disciples. As you read the narrative of Scripture, and even as we talked about in communion, how they acted and how they were, even up to the point of Jesus' death. This was a group of men uh, who came from mostly humble backgrounds, who uh, had jobs akin to middle class, maybe even lower middle class, working class people like fishermen uh, or tax collectors or zealots. You had this ragtag group of people who came from nowhere. Most of them didn't have education. Matthew, the tax collector, would have been hated. You had people from all different parts of Israel. You had Galileans and people from Judah, and those didn't mix very well. So you had this weird conglomerate of disciples who, again, if you're a fisherman, your life expectancy was pretty short. You knew you were going to work your tail feathers off to provide for your family, and that was going to be it. And here they're called into this, this phenomenal ground-level venture by a rabbi in Galilee. And this rabbi, maybe they took a chance on him because, because he wasn't really well known at, the point, at that point, but his teaching was clear, his teaching was authoritative, and his teaching was powerful. So in Galilee, he was well known, but, but he wasn't this universally well known man. But then as, as they started to follow Jesus, Jesus started to do miracle after miracle after miracle in a progressive way, and all of a sudden, he's now known in the whole nation. And there's a buzz growing, and, and the disciples are like, man, we just got called into, I don't know even how this happened, but we got in on, like, Apple in the beginning. Like, we got in on this ground floor whole thing, and this is, this is pretty great. And, and again, I don't blame them. Think about what they heard Jesus tell them along the way. In Matthew 19, in Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus promised them that they were going to sit in the future on the 12 thrones of Israel and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. What? Like these fishermen are going to be kings? These fishermen are going are to sit and rule over all of the ruling class and all the religious class? I mean, this was the hope of every Jewish boy and the prayer of every Jewish mom, that, that my kids would make good, that this is, this is a pretty phenomenal thing. So not only did Jesus promise that to them, he, was, he gave them, they were privy to Jesus' transfiguration. You'll remember in Matthew 17 and Luke 9 that three of the disciples got to go up with Jesus as he was transfigured. They got to hear when God broke normal protocol and said in an audible voice, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. That would mark you. They got to see Moses and Elijah hanging out talking about what Jesus was going to do in the coming days. I mean, that's a pretty special experience to have. So they have been promised, they were privy to, and then they were privileged to sit with Jesus in the upper room on the night before he died and watched as Jesus explained how the Passover pointed to his upcoming sacrifice. Now, all of these experiences and teachings I would think if you're a common everyday fisherman or a hated one like a tax collector or a zealot trying to push out the Romans, that all of that, maybe you'd hear all of those things that were going to happen to you. You came from nowhere. You are promised these riches. You would think maybe that would humble you at some point. But for the disciples, it hadn't had that effect. For the disciples, they weren't walking in humility. It started to feed their pride. It started to feed the parts of them that they, they started to become self-important. They started to divide amongst themselves. They started to vie for positional realities. So think about how, the, how was their response to all these promises and what they were privy to and their privileges. After the promise of sitting on thrones, when Jesus says, you're going to sit on 12 thrones, what did, what did James and John do? And what did James and John's mommy do? All right, that's kind of a low blow. But what did mommy do? Is they come up to Jesus and they go, all right, we're all going to sit on thrones. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but we want first dibs. We want to sit on your right. We want the privileged positions. Not only did James and John say that, but mom even came and, and appealed to Jesus. That's dirty. That's just like, that's... that's like, man, you, how does anybody say no to a mom? 
Jesus' response to that was his rem- he remarked that the greatest in the kingdom will be servants, and those who are first in his kingdom will be slaves, which would follow the model. All he said is, all that you have to do is follow my model and my example because I've, been, I've come to this earth to give my life a ransom for many. After, tr- after experiencing the transfiguration, those three, Peter, James, and John, came off the mountain in, in Matthew 18. <clears throat> or, sorry, in Matthew 17. And again, what follows Matthew 17 is Matthew 18, that what happened right after they came off the mountain, there was a dispute of who was the greatest. And you don't, you don't have to be a theologian or, or go to seminary to draw this line. Why did that dispute come up after the transfiguration? Clearly, those three said, uh, well, it's pretty clear now who's the greatest. It's pretty clear out of the 12 that there's three privy to, to something greater. We got to experience the transfiguration. Um, have you hung out with Moses? Because I did. Uh, have you talked to Elijah? Because I did. And, and, so, and so there's a dispute. And so that, that created this angst and bitterness and frustration among the disciples. And so they start bickering and arguing of who's the greatest. Not worshiping Jesus, not saying it's all about him. They're saying it's all about me. And so Jesus had to teach him what? Unless you come to my kingdom with humility like a child, as a childlike faith, you can't be a part of my kingdom. And then in the upper room, you go back to the upper room and Jesus is in angst. Jesus is saying, I am hours away from the father treating me like a curse from, from bearing the sin to be, to be disfellowship from the Father, and, and he's in angst. In a few hours, he's going to sweat great drops like blood as he's praying. And what, as, he's, as he is unpacking this idea of communion, what are the disciples doing at that point? They're saying, they're arguing again, who's going to get the best plots of the tribes of Israel? The, the thrones are coming, baby, and I don't want to get stuck with Issachar. No one does, except Issachar, I guess. <laughs> like, no one wants that. Like, we want the best of them. Like, so they start arguing, they start elbowing, and, and they start smack-talking along the way. And what does Jesus do to counter that? What does Jesus demonstratively show them? Do you know what he did that night? He got down on his, on his knees, put on an apron, and washed their feet. He said, you're not greater than me, and I'm going to serve you. I'm going to show you what my highest value is for you. I'm going to humble myself, and I'm going to wash your feet like a common house slave would have done, and then I'm going to turn that, and I'm going to say, you should what? Wash whom? Wash each other's feet. See, they still weren't getting it that Jesus is saying it's all about humility and servanthood, not about your own greatness and not about your own position. In fact, I believe that in 1 Peter 5, 5, and 6, when Peter himself wrote about humility, he says, all of you put on or clothe yourself with humility. The word is put on the apron that a slave would have put on with humility. Do you know where he, what he was thinking of when he wrote that? He was thinking of his master who got down on his knees and washed his feet. And so this ethic of humility is of high value to Jesus. Jesus was relentless in his message to his disciples. Humility is what God desires and demands. It's what qualifies us to be a part of his kingdom and what moves us to sacrificially serve one another. Peter goes on to say, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. J.C. Ryle says the surest mark of conversion is humility. C.S. Lewis says, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. So humility is a primary ethic of God's people in his church to operate in, allowing us to put off pride and to walk humbly before God and in serving others. These last few weeks, we've been talking about marks of grace, marks of God's grace in our life. If we're going to be a healthy church, if we're going to be an effective church moving forward, 
Uh, we started back with biblical manhood and womanhood, that we want to understand who we are as men and who we are as women, the way God has designed us and created us. We, talk, we took a look at that we need to make disciples. That's a primary call of God to make disciples, and we do that of all nations. And so the church should be made up of all nations, a diverse group of people that learn to love each other. But all of that is going to take place because we are consistently willing to humble ourselves, not only before God, but before others. Without humility, the church doesn't operate. Without humility, we're going to be at each other's throat. There's going to be a lack of forgiveness. There'll be conflict all the time, unresolved. And, and we're going to split and split, and people will leave all the time because we need to walk in humility together. Listen, how Jesus framed it when he was talking about being a servant, he said it's countercultural to the way the world operates. How do we show the world that we're different in Christ Jesus is we walk humbly together, not in hierarchy, not in forced authority, not in that some people do certain things but aren't, aren't willing to do other things. We walk differently than the world and they should see that and go, That's, that is distinctive because of your humility. So that's what we want to look at today. And, and at that point, it's good to take a few minutes to consider where and how pride affects us. How does pride affect us? As we did with the disciples, pride by definition and by nature is both blinding and deceptive. And we can often discern pride. Pride is much easier to discern in your life than in my own. Like, we have good pride radar detectors. Ah, man, that guy's so prideful. That person's so prideful. Are you? No. I'm not. They are. So here are some principles of pride that we see. Here's, here's how pride operates. This is definitely not an exhaustive list. But pride seeks to justify all kinds of sin and puts qualifications on obedience. Pride seeks to justify our sin. Well, the reason I did that is because of this, this, and this. The reason I did that, it's not really my fault. The reason I, I sinned that way is because of the circumstances, the environment, my parents, my upbringing, my name it. Or I'll only obey if this happens. I'll only serve my spouse if they respond in kind. Pride, second, pride will shift and deflect away from reality and often will turn to accuse others. When you're confronted by your sin, pride will say, I'm not going to look at my sin, I'm going to turn it right away and look at your sin. Well, you are the one, you're the one who always does those things. Pride doesn't, pride wants to deflect. Pride wants to not make us the issue and, and turn it on somebody else or something else. Pride, third, pride sees ourself in a better light than we really are. That's the problem, right? Pride forces me or, or has me think that I'm actually doing better, I'm better off than I actually am. Pride plays comparison games. And usually when we play comparison games, we don't compare ourselves up, we compare ourselves down. Well, at least I'm not as bad as that person. Whew, I feel better. I don't compare myself to scripture or God's holiness. I compare myself to some people in this room and then I feel better about myself. I wasn't looking at you, Howard, intentionally. I'm just saying. I'm so prideful. That's the problem. All right, here we go. Proves my point. Pride, here, here's one too. Pride loves when others fail. Pride takes delight in other people's failure because it puffs us up and makes us feel better when other people fail. Pride wants to rank people and sin in order to minimize both. Pride ranks people. We, we see some people as better than others or worse than others, and it also ranks sin. We can sanitize certain sins as not as important because we're not doing the biggies. We're not doing the major sins, and as long as we're not doing the major sins, maybe we're okay. And so we rank sins when God doesn't. And lastly, pride sees others as, having, as being less important than ourselves. And we see others as having insignificant value compared to us. Basically the opposite of Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. 
Can you or do you resonate with any of these or others like it? And be careful, it's a trick question. We all struggle with this. C.S. Lewis says, if you think you are not conceited, it means that you are very conceited indeed. So this morning, we want to look at Luke 17, 1 to 10, and how humility is needed for us to work through relationships. Folks, we're in this thing together. We're going to be much stronger and more healthy when we walk together. And one of the hard things for us to walk together, and over the last 15 to 18 months, we've been compelled to stay apart, to isolate, to separate, right, from from outside forces. Also, now we have new people coming in, we have people leaving the state, and so now the church is jumbled up, and and we are are prone to to believe a lie that says, no one here is like me. This church doesn't, doesn't reach out to people like me. This is an unfriendly place. I don't have any friends here. I I can't operate here because of X, Y, and Z. And and we're prone to believe that lie because it takes humility, radical, supernatural humility given to us to start to see people not in what makes us different, but how we start to move toward each other and love each other. We're in this together. And we're going to be much more healthy and strong if we start building intimate relationships, but in those intimate relationships, it's going to be challenging and hard. There's hard people here, and I'm one of them. Relationships are hard. So here's, here's what we need. Luke 17, 1 to 10. How do we work through relationships? How do we grow in our dependency on God? And how do we identify ourselves as servants? So let's read this together. Luke 17, 1 to 4. We'll start there. Humility is foundational for loving relationships. And he, Jesus, said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Here's a key phrase. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Challenging text. So before d- digging into this hard text, there are two fundamental issues that we have to remember that are at play here. The first is this, and we talked about it last week, but as disciples of Jesus, we share a common commitment to pursue righteousness and holiness. As we pursue God and pursue his glory, as we understand that when I'm saved, I have Jesus' righteousness imputed to me. Not only does God see me through the lens of Jesus' righteousness, but I have his life, his righteousness, his resources given to me so that now I could actually live righteously. Before that, any of my works just counted against me. Now I could actually live a holy life. Folks, that means that it should be one of our highest agenda items is how are we growing in our holiness and righteousness, right? Like, that should be something that is regular in our thought. I want to become more and more like Christ every day. But the second reality is this. We're not to pursue holiness and righteousness in isolation, but rather we're to do it together. It's not only provides encouragement, right? We need each other to encourage each other, but, but what happens is in relationships, other people become mirrors in my own heart and soul. Just like in my marriage, right? Isn't isn't that, that happens in marriage that really, as I'm talking to my spouse, there's a mirror there as I, I'm seeing things get revealed, things get exposed out of my heart that would have never been exposed before. We not only get to serve each other, we grow by dealing with each other's sin, resolving conflict, and learning to love. If you think you can be in relationships at this church without having sin be revealed in your own heart or somebody else's, you don't understand what relationships are. They're hard. But the core sentence here is the command between these two commands, pay attention to yourselves. They were to give careful attention to be aware about what, uh, what they teach others and how they deal with sin Here it is, relationships have the opportunity to bring out the best in us, but also the propensity to reveal the worst. 
Relationships bring out the best in us, but also reveal the worst in us. So here's, here's kind of how it's framed in these four verses. First, there had to be humble care not to lead anyone into sin. There's, there's two uh, truths here, two universal truths. One is temptations will come. There's always going to be temptations, but the second thing is they better not come from us. And here's the framing of the context here. What Jesus was pointing to was the teaching of the Pharisees. The teaching of the Pharisees led people astray. They tempted people to operate out of works, out of their own righteousness. And if you teach somebody that to become more acceptable to God comes through the conduit of your own works, of your own effort, of your own righteousness, I mean, that is about as damnable teaching as there is. That's why Jesus said, man, that person who leads people astray, who've been given the task of showing people the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they teach them the exact opposite, it'd be better for them to tie a millstone around their neck, toss it in the sea, and down they go. Like, that would be better. That would be better. And so, and so temptations will come. Woe to them through whom they come. Second, there's a humble connection in here to rebuke a brother. Not only are we called not to lead others into sin, we are actually called to lead others out of it, out of sin. We say it all the time in our membership time, our membership uh, time together, is that uh, we have a responsibility in relationships to help each other become more like Jesus Christ. A lot of times we don't like to talk in reality. We'd rather talk about the weather. We'd rather complain about the government. We'd rather talk about our sports teams than talk about what's really going on in our mind and heart. But you have a responsibility, if you're in relationship here, to actually help each other deal with our own sin. The first way we do this is to rebuke or admonish a fellow believer. Here Luke gives a principle of dealing with sin where Matthew gave a process of how it's supposed to happen. This isn't being judgmental. It doesn't mean, ah, the church is full of judgmental people. No, this is a caring, loving act that we do with people. This is not nitpicking. This isn't fruit evaluation. This is helping people deal with their real sin. So a few principles here on rebuking each other. Very briefly, just remember this. If we're gonna enter in, if there is sin in my life that you see, and you want to talk to me about it. Jordan, I've noticed that the way you talk to people is really out of bounds in the way the Bible talks about how you use your words. How do I, how do I enter into that conversation? What do I need to know to actually rebuke somebody or, or help somebody see their sin? First, according to Matthew 18, 15, the goal of all of that is to win a brother. The goal is always to win a brother, to actually see them see their sin, repent of their sin, and, and now be restored. The process should always start in private first. So if I see something in your life or you see something in my life, don't talk to people about it. Don't post about it. Actually, come talk to me. Do you know that that's like one of the hardest steps I've found in my time in ministry? How many of us have ever talked about somebody's sin to somebody else? Let's be honest. How many of you have actually gone through the process where you've seen sin? You can put your hands on, that's good. That's good. Uh, How many of us have seen sin in somebody else? We don't know what to do. We hope somebody else does it. And and it happens to me as a pastor every once in a while. Somebody will come and talk to me. They're like, hey, do you know so-and-so is doing such and such? You know what you should do about that? And what's my response? Oh, well, why don't you go talk to them about it? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. I'm just, I don't, I don't know enough. I, that's not, I'm not a pastor. I don't, no, no, no. Like you saw it, right? Yeah. You love them. Yeah. You know whose responsibility it is? Yeah. (laughs) Right? Like it's yours. So go talk to them. It's your responsibility. Third, we only rebuke what is clearly seen and stands written. According to first, first Corinthians four, one through six, we can only we can only judge, and, and 1 Corinthians 5 uses that term, what we can see. Like, I can't, in other words, I can't judge your motives and intentions. God will do that. God will bring all of those things out to the surface. He will judge those one day. But I can't tell you if you're operating in selfishness and pride. I can ask you the question, but I can't, I can't validate that because only you know. 
Fourth, we remember that love covers a multitude of sins. We do it out of love. We do it out of care and compassion. And Galatians 6 one says we look to ourselves first or at the same time. I'm going to look to myself and make sure I'm not doing this out of improper motives or I'm not struggling with the same thing. And then we have a humble conviction to truly forgive. Humble conviction to truly forgive. Forgiveness is key. If we're not willing to forgive, humility and forgiveness, especially as we offer forgiveness to others, you, if you're not walking in humility, this whole process is going to seem uh, grating. It's going to seem uh, overreaching. But if humbly we're saying, I want to become more like Christ, I want to help you become more like Christ, and I talk to you about your sin, you're going to receive that humbly, or at least fight to receive it humbly, and now we're walking together. We live in a world, listen, we live in a world that's so easily offended, are we not? We're like so easily offended. And and the offense comes in all kinds of different shapes and sizes, like if you disagree with me, I'm offended. If you say something I don't like, I'm offended. If you do something I don't like, I'm gonna sue you. It's it's fascinating with this virus that's going on, do you know about that? Uh, It's fascinating that what we're seeing in our culture is that somebody has to be blamed for somebody getting sick. Man, it used to be we just blamed God. That was, those are the good old days. Now, like, we blame every, like, it's, it's the blame the government, blame vaccinated or non-vaccinated, blame the hospitals and doctors or so. Like, I got sick, somebody is to blame. We're so easily offended and quick to shifting the blame from God's sovereign hand and his providential hand and and saying, okay, now how do I bear up under this and how do I glorify him? Just saying, somebody's got to pay. Somebody died, somebody pays. Some of you are in in law, uh, law enforcement or other agencies and it's like, man, you could do everything right according to the book. You could do everything right in every decision and you're still gonna pay. That's the culture we live. Folks, can we just say right now, we should be the least offended people anywhere. We should not be offended when the world speaks to us the way the world is supposed to speak to us. We should not be offended when the world acts like the world and says immoral, wicked, angry things. That should not offend us. That should actually cause us to have compassion. I'm telling you, Grace Church of Simi Valley, stop being so easily offended with with all that's going on. And so so if we can turn that corner, now we can actually move toward humbly, not only helping each other deal with our sin, but actually forgiving others. Forgiveness is the choice to remember a sin no more, to hold a sin, or to no longer hold a sin against a brother. We have the ability to forgive. No one has to earn it. We can freely offer it. It's a choice we make. It's not an easy choice. It means we give up our right to our pound of flesh. It means we give up our right from somebody having to earn it. We give up our right saying, nope, you did this back here. I say, no, that's been paid for. And so we can forgive each other. Forgiveness is a transaction that can happen in the moment and it's the foundation for things like rebuilding trust, respect, and leadership, which are also choices but take time to rebuild. Forgiveness should happen all the time in our existence together because we are undoubtedly going to sin against each other. Isn't that true? Undoubtedly, I'm going to say things. I may say something to you. I may do something to you, even unintentionally, that may hurt you. And in that, we need to work through this process of asking for forgiveness and giving it. And when I offer forgiveness to you, it means I'm no longer going to hold it against you. I'm going to remember it no more. I'm not going to forget it because I can't. I'm going to remember it no more actively against you. It happens in marriage. It happens in your home with siblings all the time. And the question that the disciples had is, that's neat, but how often am I supposed to forgive? And, and read here, what, did, what was the answer to that? If he sins, somebody sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive. Yikes. A couple of thoughts on forgiveness. Ephesians 4, 32, we forgive just like God forgave us. Just like God in Christ forgave us, we forgive in Christ. 
The only way that I can really forgive, especially a sin done against me, is that I forgive the same way God forgave me, and all of that sin is paid for by the work of Jesus Christ at the cross. Every sin done laid on him, and he paid for it all. Psalm 51 says, God is much more offended by sin than we should ever be. Sin is highly offensive to God. Matthew 18 says, I have been forgiven an unpayable debt. I've been forgiven much so I can forgive much. And Matthew 6 says, when I fail to forgive, God will not forgive me. Lack, lack of forgiveness is a sign that we fail to love either God or others. And ultimately, we leave the judgment for other people in God's hands. Now, to answer the disciples' question, and maybe you've asked this question, how often do I need to forgive somebody if they're gonna to continue to come back and ask for forgiveness? Here Jesus says seven times in another passage, what did he say? Seven times seven, or was it seven times 70? So, so then the, the question is, okay, 490, start. Okay, you get to 491, you're out, bud. Like, that's not gonna happen. No, what was the point is that you continue to forgive and forgive and forgive. And what was, what was the disciples' initial response? Look at verse 5. The disciples' response is what our response is. <laughs> verse 5. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Like, who can do that? Who can forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive? The answer is God, and then he calls us to do the same thing. But who can? No, 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 God, you don't understand. They've sinned against me. Me, me, they've sinned against me. Maybe you didn't understand that sin, me. Increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith, like the grain of a mustard seed, you would say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Here's what we see is that humility operates in dependency. The disciples actually, their phrase, increase our faith, was good because they recognized what they were saying is, we can't do this on our own. We need something to help us. I, who can do that? That's so counterintuitive to our thinking as people. Like, who can keep, who, who's, the, who's the sucker that keeps letting somebody do stuff to them and keeps forgiving them? We are. We are. The call to follow Jesus is a call to die. The call to turn from self, to trust him, to discontinue living in the world. And here's, here's what, what Jesus does as he, he redirects them and says, it is absolutely an issue of faith and there is faith available to you by the vast resources in Jesus Christ. Folks, I can't wait. Ephesians 1, listen, I'm going to give you a little, like this is a little taste test. Ephesians 1 is we have this vast storehouse of resources in Jesus Christ. All the resources Christ has, look at, we have. It's like we've been given this, this huge pot of money that will never be diminished. We can write checks and checks and checks and checks and cash them, cash them, cash them, and it never diminishes, and that's available to us in Christ. No one can ever say, I don't have the resources available to me because I, I just can't do it. I can't love my wife this way. She doesn't respond to me. I can't, I can't forgive this because I'm, I'm not strong enough to do it. We have the vast resources in Jesus Christ by his grace lavished on us. We just have to believe them. And so that's what Jesus is saying. You could have faith. If you had faith, you would have the research, you, and the resources are there. You just have to access them and believe them and walk in them. None of us as believers can ever say that a command given by God in Scripture is something we can't do. If God says it, he will supply us with the resources to do it. And he will always provide the future grace that we need to accomplish it. Well, lastly, look at how humility delights in servanthood. Look at uh, verses 7 to 10. Will any of you who has a servant, now he points it to the disciples. You, again, here's the picture. You yourself have a servant. And has a servant plowing or keeping sheep Say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded to do? 
So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are simply unworthy servants. We have done only what was our duty. Here's how Jesus finished this discourse to teach this ethic of humility. He told a story of a servant to illustrate the function and mindset needed for a faith-driven, grace-dependent, forgiving, forgiveness offering, willingly rebuking, and stumblingly, stumbling avoiding disciple. So the picture was simple. In this day, you would have bond servants in a house. Sometimes they'd be purchased. Sometimes they'd be uh, inherited. But, but the role of a servant was simply to do the will of the master. And he's, he's saying, you are, you are the one who has this servant. And, and here is the day. A servant would get up when day broke, and he'd go to bed when night came. And all day, the role of the servant, seven days a week, was to serve. And he served at the will and the whim of the master. And here the story goes that the servant would go out in the field, he'd plow the field, he'd tend the sheep, he'd do whatever a servant does. He'd come in, and the master says, hey, thanks for coming in, but you kind of smell. Why don't you clean yourself up before you fix my food? And after you're done fixing my food, you can eat, and by that time, I'm going to go to bed. And that was the day. And then you know what tomorrow brought? The same thing. That was the story. And what Jesus is saying here is that in humility, that servant is going to do that day in and day out. And you know what the master never actually does for the servant in that time? He never even says what? Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, he never even says thank you. Isn't that how we operate sometimes? Like, I found when I've served, sometimes, nope, all the time, I want to be noticed for serving. I still remember uh, this one time I served my wife, this one time. Uh, I remember she was gone, and, and when she came back, I had uh, tried to clean those areas that I don't normally see. Uh, Aaron says, when I clean, I don't really clean. I'm like, I don't know. Like, it seems pretty clean. Everything's picked up. She goes, you don't deep clean. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Dig? I mean, go deep. I don't know. Uh, so she left, and I, and I cleaned the, the bathroom mirror because they had those little flex, you know, from your toothbrush. Anyway, no? Okay, so I cleaned the mirror, and I cleaned the kitchen sink. And do you know when she got home, she had the audacity not to notice? <laughs> Audacious. And, and so I, I, I found my, I did it because I love her, I want to serve her, but, but as she went through her day, uh, as she got home, she didn't notice. And she still didn't notice. Still didn't notice. So I'm like, hey, hey, why don't you, you want to brush, brush your teeth? <laughs> wash, wash dishes? <laughs> In other words, I couldn't live in the tension of serving without being thanked. Like, and I, I just wanted her to notice, right? And say, well, man, well, that's well done, thank you. Once, you notice, right? Like, that, I, I want, but that's, Jesus is saying, here it is. As humble servants in God's church with each other, we operate truly as slaves, truly as servants. We do it because we want to honor the Lord. We do it because, listen, we don't act like servants, we take on the mindset and the identity of servants. Do you see the difference? If you act like a servant, you're going to serve, but there's going to be other motives in there. You're going to do it to be seen, to be known, to move up the ranks, to go into the inner circle, whatever it is. You're going to do it for other reasons. If you take on the mindset and the identity of a servant, now you go, I'm doing only what I ought to do. You see, here's the problem with our service. We like the idea of serving until somebody treats us like a servant. We all like the idea of serving. Ah, oh, I'll serve here, I'll serve here. And, and do you know the limits that that puts on us? It's, here's how I hear it. I'll serve, but I'll only serve in this area. Yeah, but we don't need you in that area. We need you in this area. Yeah, that's for somebody else. I do this. This is my area of service. I'll serve all day long. Well, most of the, some of the, I'll serve once in this area. But don't ask me to, I don't, I don't hang out with kids. I don't stack chairs. I don't clean. I don't stay long. I don't do those things. If we take on the mindset of a humble servant, we say, what is it, what is it that needs to get done? What are the things that need to happen? Actually, I don't need you to stack chairs. 
I need you to go over to the hospital and visit with somebody. I need you to have that hard conversation with somebody. I need you to listen to this person. Ah, oh, I don't do that. No, 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 no people. I don't want people. Oh, let me just serve in the background. When we take on the mindset of a servant, we are unlimited in the amount of service we can actually do. And notice here, it's not just servants, but notice what these servants said in verse 10. We are unworthy. We're unworthy servants who serve a most worthy king, a most worthy master. We never outgrow this status, but by faith we embrace it more and more, causing greater joy and greater effectiveness. When we embrace this mindset, forgiveness becomes possible. We care about others in a way that goes beyond what they can do for us. We are not easily offended because we know what we truly deserve. We are quick to love, quick to give grace, quick to cover an offense, and quick to grant mercy. This is the distinctive living of a distinctive gospel. So just a few implications to ponder. We, in humility, we maintain unity by staying humble in differences. We serve each other, not in the ways we want to, but in the ways that are needed. First Thessalonians 5.14, sometimes we need to admonish the unruly, sometimes we need to encourage the faint-hearted, sometimes we need to help the weak, and all times we have to be patient with each other. And we willingly pursue each other, overcoming our insecurities and selfishness by humbling ourselves in the same way that our Savior did. Jesus never calls us to something he himself didn't do to the point of death, even death on a cross. I'll leave you with this, C.S. Lewis said this, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this morning, thank you for this challenge. And as people, as a man myself who has operated in pride for decades, who knows exactly what pride is and what it looks like, I ask and I pray that you would allow your people to humble themselves before you. That we would humble ourselves before your hand, before who you are, that we would see ourselves for what we truly are as unworthy servants. That we'd have a proper view of ourselves so that as we see ourselves in that light, that we can truly begin to serve each other. Serve without thankfulness, even though that's a good thing, that we can serve for others good, that we could point people to Christ, that we would be a drink offering poured out for you, that our life would matter in, in the impact on other people and you being pleased with us in humility, not what we can do. So humble us, Lord. May that mark us as a church. May that mark us as families. May that mark us as individuals, that this group of people is truly humble before you. So we love you, and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, I love you guys. Uh, thanks for hanging for that time. We'll start the book of Ephesians next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.